All right, so I forgot to start the recording, so we'll pick up and show what we have so far. We added validation. Our first validation, we're using the getType method to see if there's been a valid type selected. If there has not been a valid type selected, we are accumulating our error messages in a variable called error message, and we're making an unordered list of them. So if there's a problem, we set be valid to false, and we concatenate a list item to that error message string. When we're all done, we close the UL tag. If there is a problem, then we go and display that UL. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the validation of the hours. I'm going to copy this line of code. Now remember, this hours variable here and this hours variable here are two different variables. So they happen to have the same name and we're setting them to the same value, but one function can't access the other functions. They're separate variables. So I'm grabbing the value from there. So what I want to do is I now want to test to see if nothing is in there. So if hours equals an empty string, then be valid equals false, error message equals must enter hours. Now in the spirit of how we've been doing this all along, I added a little bit of code. I'm going to test it. Again, it was working well a minute ago. So if there's a problem, problem probably exists in these lines of code I added right now, all right, which is a good thing. So refresh. I'm not going to enter anything in for hours, and I'm not going to enter anything in for the man, uh, uh, job type. Boom. There's my error list. All right, so far so good. Now we could do this a few different ways. This is the way I am going to do it. I'll put an else here, right? Because this is checking to see if there's nothing in there. This is checking to see if there's something in there, but it's an invalid value. Like, for example, if it's not a number. And I have to Google this, because I know the function, but I can't quite remember how to use it. I think I remember. function to determine whether something is not a number is is an an uh, with the, 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 the two n's capitalize everything else lowercase. And it will tell us how it works. And you simply put in a string inside there and it will tell you if it's a number or not. Remember though, it's looking this is, this is a case of almost like being a double negative. It's testing to see if it's not a number. All right. So, is, not, is NAN hours is, valid, is, is, is testing to see if the value in hours is not a number. So that's not okay. That's an error. So if it's not a number, and again, we're going to want to be precise with our error message. So I'm going to say, must enter a number in for hours. Yes.
So like if I wrote if I wrote two TWO as a string, no, it doesn't it doesn't evaluate a string and, and tell you if it's uh, if the string it would be a number. Now notice this is a nested if statement. Some people tell you to avoid nested if statements, but we're tough and we're not going to avoid them. We're going to be careful with them, all right? Sometimes you can rewrite your code to get rid of nested if statements, but I don't think there's anything to be afraid about. One of the key things is, is being sure you indent things correctly. So notice how this is indented. So this is a true part of the first if statement. This is a false part of the first if statement. So if the first if statement is false, then we have another if statement, and this is a true part of that. So let's go and test this. So now, I'm testing if you put garbage in there. Must enter a number for hours. If I put nothing in there, must enter hours. boom, it calculates, except it didn't get rid of that error message. It left those error messages in there, which we can easily take care of by, as soon as we go into validate, <coughs> set the inner HTML to an empty string. That will get rid of any errors that were there before. Now, let's try to let's try to make a prediction here. For your assignment where you have to display the coins a certain number of times, are you going to have to do something like that? Yes or no question? have to get rid of the pictures of coins each time. Because otherwise, if you picked four pennies, it would show four pennies. If you pick then five nickels, if you don't get rid of those four pennies, it's going to show four pennies and five nickels. And you just want to show the five nickels. So yes, you're probably going to have to do something like this. All right. So let's... Test this again. Center nothing in for both. Let's pick that and enter nothing for that. That works. Let's enter some garbage in here. That works. All right. So now the last thing we're going to do is we're going to test to see if there is a negative number in there. So that can be an else statement here. I've had students ask me, you know, request, gee, it would be great if you commented your code, all right, which is probably true. I am commenting my code as I'm talking through it, all right. If you want to have actual contents, uh, comments in my example, that would be a great study exercise to do. In other words, after we complete this and I post the example, go through and put comments in the code that explain what it's doing. And if you do that, I'll be glad to double check. All right? If you do that, you're even welcome to post it to the forum, to the discussion board, to, to share it with other people. All right? Um, let's talk through, though. This part of the if statement, the very first if statement, is going to make sure something was entered. If nothing was entered, we get this error message. So this else only goes into effect if something was entered. This is going to weed out any numeric or non-numeric um, entries. So if it's a non-numeric entry, we're going to get this error message. So if it made it to this part of the if statement, then we know that something was entered and that something is numeric. So the last thing that we need to test is if it is a negative number, because a negative number is invalid. I mean, the least number of hours that you can work is zero. Now, I've worked with some people 
who probably by coming into work did more damage than good. So you could say that they undid a eight hours of work for every eight hours of work that they work. But unfortunately, that's not how payroll works. All right. So I'm going to have my last test here to test to see if hours is less than zero. And if it's less than zero, we know the, we know the form's not valid, and we want to display our error message. And I'm just going to change the wording of this a little bit to say we must enter a positive number for that. So we come here. We don't enter anything in. Boom. Ooh, I broke something. All right. Do you see what's wrong? Well, I'm going to pretend I don't see what's wrong. It's funny. It's great, like, um, for the 216 students, uh, the students in the Intro to Web Development class, um, how quickly I can, I can find their errors. They're amazed and they think that I'm brilliant. And, and what they don't realize is, A, I've made those very same errors a million times, so I recognize them when someone else makes them. And B, I've seen students make those errors 10 million times, so I recognize them faster still. So over time, you develop that sort of skill to recognize errors when they happen. But I'm going to pretend I didn't see the problem, and I'm going to systematically take an approach. Now, I know right off the bat that the error is probably in these lines of code, right, which is a good thing. And I could stare at those, but I'm going to take a systematic approach and look under More Tools, Developers Tools, Council, and we get some ugly errors here. Number one, it says process form is not defined. Now that seems harsh, right? We've defined process form. Define process form. What does it mean it's not defined? Well, the way the browser runs JavaScript is that if there's a bad enough error in your JavaScript, the script doesn't really load. So if there's a big enough error within the script tag, if there's a bad enough error within that script tag, the browser doesn't recognize any of those functions is existing. It can't load the script. So if, if you see an error that says a function is not defined, what that means is there's probably a big error in the script somewhere that's keeping it from being loaded. All right. After you've checked to make sure that you haven't misspelled it and that the, the case is right and those sorts of things. Now here is the more meaningful error message. Unexpected token, a parenthesis, in line 33. Now, if we look at line 33, it's this line right here. An unexpected token means what? It means that a token is a character. It saw a character that it wasn't expecting. All right? Another way of saying that is that there is an extra something. What is there an extra of in this line. Yes. Closing Extra closing parenthesis. Now, again, we knew the problem was with those four lines of code. So I shouldn't have been surprised when it pointed me to that line of code for there being a problem. All right. So we correct that and now I hope we're back in business. So I enter nothing, I get that error message. I'm going to select something. All right, still get the correct error message. I'm going to enter garbage in here, get a correct error message. 
I enter a negative number in here, get the correct error message. I enter a positive number in here, and it does a calculation. All right. The stuff that we've learned in this example, even though this is sort of a arbitrary, small little example that I just made up, is going to help us throughout the semester. Because when we get to Ajax, we are going to be doing things like this writing inner HTML all the time. All right, because we're going to get stuff back from the server and we're going to display it on the page. How are we going to display it on the page? We're going to find a section of the page and we're going to write some HTML tags to that location on, on the, the screen. Likewise, with your coin example, you're going to write some coin images to that section of the page. We're always going to be doing validation, right? I mentioned about the HTML5 controls. Unfortunately, the browser support is such that even if you use the HTML5 controls, you still probably need to validate them just for the browsers that do not uh, support those controls. The other thing I would say that, that's, that's good is the notion of developing things incrementally and um, doing a bit, testing it, doing a bit, testing it, doing a bit, testing it. If it stops working, you can be reasonably assured it's the, it's the instructions that you've just added. And use the error console within the browser to get an idea of specifically what line went wrong. I want to talk about testing this. All right? Because we talked about testing before. title on this page because it should have a title. Now we talked about this before. We know that every if statement in our program constitutes a branch, constitutes a fork in the road that the program could go this way or it could go that way. So if we want to thoroughly test our program, we need to account for all the conditions and handle all the paths that our program could go through. So, one of the things we want to do is we want to test for invalid data, and we're going to test for valid data. There are, then our validation code, there are four if statements. So that's four things that we should test. So I'm going to write some test cases, all right, test with no entry for hours. Test with non-numeric hours. Test with negative hours. Test with no type chosen. So in our testing, to thoroughly test this, and I believe I did this, all right, I, I might not have done what I'm going to describe now, I might not have done all today, but between today and last time, um, I've done this. We should, of course, repeat the other part of the testing because once you have made changes to a program, don't count on the fact that it didn't cause any new errors. But to test the validation, I would need to test these four conditions. All right. To test, in the case of valid data, I would need to test each of the categories. So manager with less than 40, manager with greater than 40, associate with less than 40, 
associate with greater than 40, trainee with less than 40, trainee with greater than 40. So to really thoroughly test this, we would need to test at least 10 conditions. All right. It's good to spend some time thinking about what you need to test and even documenting it. Um, I didn't for this example, but for future examples, I might very well ask for what's called a test plan. A test plan being the different things, the different criteria that you're going to test. And it's a good idea to do that, even if it's not an assignment, because you need to know, you need to make sure that it works. Um, depending on the kind of calculation, one of the things that I like to do, uh, in, in, and we probably will do in this class, is I like to repeat LC's uh, tuition calculation, which depends on how many credit hours you're taking and uh, whether you're in county, out of county, and out of state. And there's a chart that's followed. All right. Um, on the surface, it may look like there's only three things to test. But really, when you look at the code, or when you look at um, the chart, there's really a bunch more things to test because there's a quirk of the way that they handle 13 through 18 credit hours, all right? Or actually, everything over 13 credit hours uh, doesn't work the same way. So you need to test that thoroughly to make sure that those things do the job that they're supposed to. Questions about this? All right, next week, we are going to talk about jQuery. Does anyone know what jQuery is? Yes. It's a light version of JavaScript. That's a good way to say it. Um, light in the sense, not that it is less functionality, but light in the sense that it's easier to use. A library. A library. Right. Right. So you could call it a library. You could call it a framework. Um, but you can build on top of it. In other words, we've learned all these JavaScript commands, and we've seen that they're not too hard, and we understand exactly how they work, but there's a way to do some of these things quicker in jQuery. All right? and, and that's what we're going to pick up on. All right? Because even though we know how to do something from scratch, it doesn't mean that we don't want to take shortcuts sometimes. And if there is a tool that allows us to do things quicker, then it's a win-win situation for, for everyone. So that's what we will pick up on next time. Are there any questions? All right, we'll see you over in lab.